I'd now like to introduce Dr. Dan Tomasulo. Dr. Dan Tomasulo is the recently appointed incoming academic director of the Spirituality Mind Body Master of Arts degree program and core faculty member and full time lecturer in the Department of Clinical Psychology at Teachers College at Columbia University. Dr. Tomasulo's scholarly interests center on human development, intellectual and psychiatric disabilities, with a current emphasis on the transformational properties of learned hopefulness. His clinical orientation is informed by extensive postdoctoral training in psychodrama, with a current focus on the application of psychodramatic methods to the development of positive emotions. Most recently, he has been honored by the International Positive Psychology Association's Clinical Division for his work on the virtual gratitude visit and the use of embodied cognition in the development of self-compassion. His award-winning memoir, American Snake Pit, Hope, Grit, and Resilience in the Wake of Willowbrook, was released in 2018 and tells of the social injustice behind America's most notorious asylum, Willowbrook. His most recent book, Learned Hopefulness, The Power of Positivity to Overcome Depression, is hailed as the perfect recipe for fulfillment, joy, peace, and expansion of awareness by Deepak Chopra. Martin Seligman, author of Flourish, adds, this is the best go-to book on how to use hope to relieve your depression. Welcome, Dan. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I am really honored to be here today. I love this group. I love everything that you stand for and the work that you're doing. And I am absolutely thrilled to be uh, invited to do this keynote. So without uh, further ado, let me jump right in. And my hope is that today we're going to cover a, a variety of different things that have to do with your own personal well-being and how we can apply some of these principles to the folks we work with. Uh, beginning with the agenda, I'm going to go through the brief history of psychology, talk about a shift in perception, do some work on positive emotions in particular to give you some experiences with gratitude, talk a little bit about my background and interest as it applies uh, for today, and then uh, talk about learned hopefulness and character strengths. So um, just so that you know, when I get anxious, I create PowerPoint slides. So I have about seven thousand slot not not quite that many but i have quite a few slides today so i'm going to jump right into uh to sharing them let's start with a brief history of psychology if i had to give a uh, three second presentation on what positive psychology is all about i would show thoreau's quote and uh point to it for the other two seconds the truth is we're going to learn quite a bit about how we can change and what the new science of positive psychology has focused on. We go all the way back to William James. If you take a look at the very last thing on this quote, we really have the essence of our capacity for focusing on new things, different things, better things. My experience is what I agreed to attend to. Throughout the presentation today, I want you to keep that fresh, keep that in your mind about what it is we're doing for ourselves and hoping to help others do. That's to give them the power to shift their perception from what we might call wrong to what is called strong. This is a new theory of well-being it's only been out to uh, maybe about 10 years now um, it's affectionately called perma it has the five pillars of positive psychology so if i were going to take the time to um, pass information on to you about the weather and i said it's about 80 degrees out you wouldn't have enough information about the weather to make a decision about what to do because you wouldn't know if it's raining, you wouldn't know if the sun is out, if the humidity is high. PERMA, this idea of well-being, works in the same way. We're saying that in order to understand happiness and well-being, you can't just give one measure, like a measure of happiness. You have to look at it from a spherical point of view, from very different perspectives. So positive emotions, engagement, positive relationships, meaning and accomplishment. These are all the elements of PERMA 
that give us a way to understand how we can measure well-being and more importantly what ways we can apply it if we start with the idea of a negativity bias a negativity bias basically means that we were born to survive and so there's a negativity uh, sense a bias about what it is we're going to pay attention to and when we pay attention to things that are threatening it narrows our perspective it keeps our ideas our thoughts our behaviors very very limited so if a tiger comes uh, after us we know that we only have one goal so it's very narrow but when we start to talk about positive emotions we see here that we have the capacity to build resources to make it something that we are engaged in that helps us grow so the shift between negative emotions to positive emotions has a wide variety of impact on our well-being from physical to mental to academic to accomplishment in in so many different arenas literally at this point thousands of studies showing the benefit of a positive uh, emotion the other thing that we're noticing in the last 20 years or so is the introduction of character strengths. In the history of psychology, we were focused on what's wrong, removing pain and suffering. Nothing wrong with removing pain and suffering. But the problem is, if all we do is remove what's not okay, what's wrong, it doesn't say anything about what's strong or what's good. So we had to develop different tools and different ways of thinking about moving people beyond the zero point if i'm down two or three on my notch and i don't feel so good and i'm depressed and i were to use the tools of traditional positive psychology i might come back to zero but it says nothing about me being happy it says nothing about me having true well-being uh, I've been in the field for quite a while, and what I can tell you is the transition in the last 20 years has been nothing so short of extraordinary. What we've learned is that the tools that we had to remove pain and suffering are not the tools that will increase our well being. We had to develop new tools and new ways of thinking. And this has really filtered down into the IDD field because we now know that if we're only trying to modify behavior, manage behavior, and bring people uh, out of a tailspin or out of something negative, we're really not doing a lot for their well-being. So character strengths end up being a way to understand what is it about being human that we can highlight, amplify, and learn about each other. These are the top 24 character strengths that are known to exist in every human culture. Um, Marty Seligman has done the research. He's the one who put forward the idea of PERMA and did the cornerstone work with uh, Chris Peterson on character strengths to help us understand uh, what it means to move toward well-being, not just away from pain, but toward well-being. This introduces an idea that I've become fascinated with during uh, the last uh, two decades. And this is Eunoia. It stands for beautiful thinking or a well mind. And it, it comes from uh, Aristotle, uh, same as most of the other stuff we study in positive psychology. Uh, it, it's the same root as Eunoia, which was their word for happiness and well being. It, it means normal mental health. This word exists in the medical books, but we never talk about what does it mean to be normal? It's some kind of statistical thing now. We think about it as an average, what's the average person? But the truth is, when we put normal mental health on the front burner, we have to include what's known as beautiful thinking. This idea that there are not only positive emotions to be harvested, and positive emotions to strive for, but they are essential to our well-being. Um, 
I hope you can appreciate this. This is this is not an image that's on the net someplace. I had to create this. This took me about two hours. So I'm going to let this image linger up here so you can take it in. Uh, the piece was different. The hand was different. The, so it, it, uh, I don't have those kind of computer skills. So uh, I'll give you a moment to appreciate it. All right, there it is. What I'm trying to do with this today is to help um, uh, show some of the principles uh, that give us a sense of hope for the future. Give us a sense of how we can activate beautiful thinking, not only in our own growth and development, but certainly for the people we work with. Um, this will give you a, a sort of a 10,000 foot view of how I think about the positive interventions. If we're going to introduce beautiful thinking, we're going to introduce positive emotions into psychology and into uh, a world where people who really need it and can use it right away, we have to try to understand what these interventions are all about. So this is the way that I've conceptualized it, that there are positive interventions that have to do with the past, those that have to do with the present, and then those that have to do with the future. If we keep in mind that there may be elements of our past that we haven't fully harvested, like our sense of gratitude, which we're going to work with today, or there are blocks or obstacles like uh, a lack of forgiveness uh, that might be jamming our positive emotions, we have to think about sort of changing our cognitive perspective about the past so that we can bring that positivity forward. The second thing has to do with what's going on in the moment. Um, and there's a lot of research now about uh, mindfulness meditation, uh, but even more specifically, um, I talk about things like dispositional mindfulness. Do we know how people are actually experiencing the moment? Uh, not a, a sitting practice only where you sit and meditate for 20 minutes, but really bring uh, a type of mindfulness into our moment to moment and daily activities. And then finally, future interventions, things like optimism, faith, intention, hope, uh, inspiration. These have to do with what's to come. So this is not a, an absolute chart. I think these things can bounce around and blend. Um, but there are benefits for us understanding past, present, and future when we think about using positive interventions. And then there are things that can really um, move around, things like character strengths, which uh, we, we might have a different configuration of character strengths from 10 years ago than we might have now because we need different strengths now. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. This is a matter of using our brain at the service of your heart. Because of that negativity bias, it means we're wired to survive but we're also wired for beauty and kindness. So what we need to do is use our way of shifting perception, shifting our thoughts so that we can start to, again, harvest and experience more of the positive emotions. So why positive interventions? Well, uh, not being depressed isn't the same as being happy. Uh, I'll speak a little bit more later on about the uh, learned hopefulness work, but about 80% of people who have been depressed uh, relapse. Um, and that doesn't bode well for psychology in general, because what it means is that no matter uh, what we've done, and that includes all the antidepressants, it includes all the interventions, all the cognitive behavior therapy, about 80% relapse. So what we need to start asking is, what are the other 20% doing that keep them in a good place? Uh, Norman Vincent Peale um, really sort of brought this into uh, American consciousness with uh, change your thoughts and you change your world. And I couldn't agree more, but I would add something to that. When we change our thoughts, uh, we also have influence on our emotions and behavior. Um, so it's not just changing your thoughts, you change your world. You can change your behavior, you can change your emotions, but all of these things are tethered back to one thing, and that's our belief system. 
So, you know, in the 60s, we talked about behavior modification. Really what I think positive psychology is doing is talking about belief modification. And it all does indeed begin with you. You are the intervention in almost every domain we can imagine. The positive well-being of the practitioner has influence on almost anything that happens. We look at that with surgeons, with therapists, with, um, in fact, there's a new study on hope that says uh, the hope the therapist has for the client they're working with is the greatest predictor of outcome. It surpasses even the hope the client has. So you are the intervention. You're the tool that really needs to be sharpened on a daily basis. And um, that's what I'm hoping you'll be able to get from this presentation today. So on the agenda, we'll move into shifts in perception. So if you would, I'm going to invite you, and I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but at the very top of this mountain range, if you would take a look at the very top of the mountain range, and then see if it is accurately reflected in the water below, in the lake below. So if you would see if it's accurately reflected, so look up here, right? And then take a look down here to see if it's a match. Now, as you're doing that, if you would take your left ear and put it on your left shoulder and look at that image again. Now, what you should see on the far left-hand side is the head of an adult. Here are the lips, nose, eyes, mouth. In a prayer pose, here the hands are together. These are the shoulders. And in front of this adult is a child, the head of a child in prayer pose, shoulders. If you go back and forth, you come back up and take a look at it as a mountain range and then shift, you'll see this perception. And what's interesting about that is that what you were looking at did not change. It stayed identical, but what did shift was the way that you looked at it. If you take a look at this, you'll actually see two words. Might take you a moment to see it. You'll see the word good with the black outline and embedded in the white, you'll see evil. I just did this at a uh, psychiatric, I did a keynote for uh, a psychiatrist conference and um, somebody was in the back of the room and they're looking at this and uh, uh, they said, I don't see it, I don't see it, I don't see it. Then suddenly uh, he became aware of it and he goes, oh, I see evil. Uh, all right, uh, here's another way. To start e explaining this idea that our perception matters, we get to choose how we're going to um, look at things. So let's shift this here. This is a floating cu cube. Or is it? This probably just shows we did way too many drugs in the 60s. But what, what we see with this is the fact that often we can mistake something. Very often people think this will make me happy, that will make me happy, when the truth is it's an illusion. And this I found on the internet, it's a seventh grade science experiment. So the work here is to challenge our perceptions to learn how to look at things in a different way. And of course, this is a painting. So perspective and orientation helps to change the way we look at things. I'm using these more than just a, a parlor trick. I'm trying to give you a way of understanding that our perceptions can alter how we see something. And the more we're able to challenge our perception, the greater our ability to make a choice that's different than the one that may not be serving us. I'm in the Positive Psychologists Union. 
which means I'm required to show this for 30 seconds during every presentation. No, that's just another bad joke. Uh, if I ask the, the question that normally comes with this image, I've done you a disservice because I'm gonna make you think that there are only two possible answers. When the truth of the matter is, the answer to this question is this glass is completely full, half with water, half with air. Ultimately, what positive psychology is doing is trying to get you to recognize that there's another way to look at this. There's another way to look at something. And ultimately, for us to be able to flip back and forth, to be able to see things one way and then another. I have a dear friend that teaches fourth grade and at the end of every year she invites me in. I have hundreds of these images to just show the kids the idea and the power behind shifting perception. This is always the one I use at the end. And uh, last semester, a kid jumped up in the back of the class and said, you're blowing my mind. <laughs> so this idea, is not to eclipse or ignore negativity. That's not the goal. If I see the gates coming down and the train is coming, not a good time for me to be optimistic. Negative thinking is important and valuable. It's just, it's not the only game in town. Now, if you take a look at this image, you'll notice that you're doing something kind of interesting. You've never seen this image before, but you've already learned to challenge yourself. What are you doing, right? You start to look at it in another way because you've learned in this incredibly short period of time that just because you see things one way the first go round doesn't mean it has to remain that way. And one of my favorites from Singapore, And isn't that what we're trying to do? We're trying to change from the negative through our perspective into the positive. Wayne Dyer, I think, captured the essence of this. If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. The mountain and reflection in the lake was no longer just that. You started to see other elements of it. And isn't that what we're asking about working with people who have disabilities? Can we look and see them one way, but then see another way to uh, identify their strengths, their abilities? Uh, I've set it up so that you can get a copy of uh, everything here, plus uh, uh, a couple of chapters of my new book and um, a few other resources. If you text uh, hopeful to 44222, it'll just ask you to opt in with an email then and it'll shoot it right over to you. Uh, I'll put that up again, but it's hopeful to 44222. We're now up to positive emotions and gratitude. Uh, if you would, I, I want you to come back and see this idea. Positive emotions is the P in PERMA. Now, obviously, in, in the brief presentation like this, I'm not going to be able to go through all of these, but I did want to give you a taste of how this works. The positive emotions, the P in PERMA, um, ends up being a, a very rich way of understanding how we uh, absorb positive emotions, how we get to them. Uh, and more importantly, uh, we're going to have an experience about how to uh, notice what our brain does when we experience them. Positive emotions um, are compared to negative emotions. Negative emotions are like pebbles. Positive emotions are like feathers. Can you get enough positive emotions in your experience to balance out the pebbles? The short answer to that is yes, absolutely. But it's not going to work like this. There's not going to be one great big thing in your life, one great big feather that's going to balance out whatever negativity there is. It doesn't work that way. We've done lots of studies. People have won the lottery. They think, oh, when I win the lottery, then I'll, and other people, uh, you know, when I get married or when I get this job or when, it doesn't work like that at all. It works a little bit more like this. If you want this to balance out, you need a lot of positivity. And so part of this isn't about a one-off sort of thing, like something you do once in a while. If you want to reap the benefits of it, you have to shift your perspective to start looking for positive elements um, on a regular basis that are in your life.
Um, if you were to look at this chart again, I want to point out that the exercise that we're coming up to right now has to do with gratitude, which is a past intervention. What I mean by that is that we typically have gratitude for something that's already taken place. It's already happened. And the reason I like it, it's kind of like the low-hanging fruit in positive psychology because um, it's already happened. So it means we don't have to fabricate or generate or gen all we have to do is unearth it, harvest it, identify it, amplify it, and bring it forward. Uh, so in this next experience, we're going to take a moment to look at your day yesterday. You're going to need a piece of paper for this or uh, you can write it down on your phone, but you do need to write this in some way on your tablet, on your phone, piece of paper. It doesn't have to be um, perfect, but you will need to um, scribble it down someplace. So here we go. What I'm going to ask you to do is to last, think about the last 24 to 36 hours. And I want you to take a full moment, and I'll keep the time, a full moment to write down everything you can think of that you did yesterday. And please, I know how tempting it would be to kind of blow this off, not do it. But uh, if you actually write it down, it'll enhance the experience. So I'm going to ask you, and everything counts, by the way. You know, I got up, I got out of bed, uh, I went back into bed, then I got up. Whatever it is, every, everything you can remember to write that down. So please begin. doesn't have to be in any order but just jot everything down that you can remember. What we're doing in this exercise is we're activating a cognitive strategy that we can call the default network of the brain. Now, please put that list in a place where you don't see it. If it's a piece of paper, because you're going to need to make another list, right? This is what you just did. You made a list of everything you can remember that you did yesterday. But now, I'm going to ask you to look at that same period of time. Look at yesterday through the lens of gratitude. I want you to write down three specific things that happened yesterday that you have gratitude for. Three specific things. So if it was a nice day, if the weather was nice, that's good. But if it allowed you to take a walk and you met a friend and the two of you had a chat because you hadn't seen one another in a while, that would be even more specific. As you're searching for these three things, if you found three rather quickly, push yourself to find a fourth. And if you're still struggling, keep searching the day. Look for something that you have gratitude for. And we're gonna, we're gonna see how this worked. Because my guess is that if you take a look at your two lists, if you look at those two lists, you're going to notice something. That the gratitude that you found may not have even shown up on your first list. Because our normal way of thinking about things is not to have the positive spin on it. So you may have found things on your gratitude list that weren't on the first one. And if you did have it on the first one, the chances are you didn't feel the same kind of positivity as when you looked at it through the second one. If we were to go back and understand what happened in this very brief experience, you had a cognitive, uh, expressive, and not quite uh, integrating with another person. I'll talk about that in a minute. When you made your two lists, the first list activated the default network of your thinking. And what that means is that you're not going to add a lot of affect in it. You're not going to add a lot of the positive emotions. Your brain is just basically scanning information. Now, what's important about that is that you were looking at the past in such a way that it was just taking note of things happening, but we really weren't able to reap any of the positive benefits of that experience. When you took a moment and captured three things that happened that you had gratitude for, you were 
experiencing something again. In other words, this is a cognitive strategy. It's a cognitive reappraisal. We're going back and looking at something positive and the changes that happen then allow us to amplify our sense of positivity. The beautiful part about that is that it's already happened. All we're doing is casting a flashlight on it. And that's the, the important part here, that we have the ability to shine that flashlight uh, in any direction we want. If I walk into a dark room and I put that light on the floor, what I'm going to see are all the cracks and the bugs and the, uh, you know, all the things that uh, seem like, oh, this whole place is terrible. But if I flash that light onto the wall, I might see a Rembrandt or, or a Picasso. The element here is to know that you have the power to shift that perception. I asked you to write it down because when we're talking about emotions, they usually are emerging from the limbic system um, or, or some, somewhere where they're not well organized in the brain. When we have to express them in words, what happens is they get integrated. So one of the reasons why we ask people about, you know, what was positive for you is not only to capture the emotion, but to help integrate it. And then the last thing, which we didn't quite get to do because of the technology, is to share that with somebody else. Because what we find is that when people share their positive experience with one another, there's an actual linking that happens. There's, there's a brain synchronization that happens when we hear positive stories and share positive stories that we call positivity resonance. Of course, you can have two much positivity they've actually studied the other side of that where we're often talking about just trying to reap the benefits of positivity but if you get very very high like 12 positives to one negative uh you'll make errors in judgment uh but i don't think we have to worry about that right now Okay, a little bit about my background and interests. A little bit about my background and interests. I've been in the field a while, I've written a bunch of different books or contributed uh, uh, to a number of them and uh, published in a variety of different journals uh, in the field. The, the one that I'd like to highlight uh, has to do with American Snake Pit. This was my memoir, and in 1979, I opened um, one of the first experimental group homes of taking people out of Willowbrook, uh, which was a, uh, they called it a state school, but it was really um, uh, the most infamous asylum in the United States. It was horrific. Uh, people with intellectual and psychiatric disabilities were uh, basically warehoused there. Uh, so imagine, just to give you an idea of the crowding, um, if a normal subway car in New York City would have 20 people on it on the average, imagine putting 50 people in that car. Uh, that's about the level of uh, overcrowding they had. My experience in working with that population was uh, to take this group out and the project was designed to fail. Uh, they were giving us money, but they uh, were sure that we wouldn't take these polydiagnostic folks with intellectual, psychiatric and physical disabilities and bring them into the community. They were sure it was gonna fail. Well, uh, spoiler alert, um, they did uh, beautifully because they were treated better and different than they were in the institution. They learned how to work together. They learned how to use their strengths and identify the staff, learned how to identify the strengths of others in the program. Um, the other uh, the other work um, that I did was the uh, first book on um, uh, psychotherapy for people with intellectual disabilities. And this was called, uh, back then, 2005, Interactive Behavioral Therapy. Sadly, it's still the only book that APA has ever published on uh, psychotherapy for people with intellectual disabilities. It was a group model. And uh, the group model uh, was changing social skills training into an interactive model. We got the teacher trainer out of the middle and helped them facilitate 
interaction between and among the members. So this was rather unique because before that, um, and this is really something we pioneered uh, um, and I write about in American Steak Pit, where we pioneered in the group homes where uh, people learning to be together in a group. And back then, 1979, they didn't think uh, people with a dual diagnosis could profit from an, a, uh, a group format. So um, this was, for its time, uh, radical. We started to do a lot of research on um, staff to uh, member interaction. What we found is that over time, member to member interaction went up, uh, uh, staff or facilitated to member interaction went down. We started studying something called therapeutic factors, which is a way to measure group. And we found that every therapeutic factor that happens, things like altruism, universality, all of these things that happened in regular groups happened in our groups. And we also looked at global assessment of functioning. I just picked uh, maybe one of the first studies we did that, uh, that showed uh, the power of um, uh, back when they used global assessment of function uh, to show that the people that were in these groups really did better because they learned how to identify what was good and supportive in their life and what other people needed as well. We also took a look at uh, some of the therapeutic factors and their emergence in the group. And again, we started to notice exactly the same thing in our groups as others. Um, eventually, what happened is I went from being a uh, trauma expert and working in, in the field to uh, putting my toes in with positive psychology. So I started to add on to the therapeutic factors with character strengths. And instead of just teaching the facilitators to look for therapeutic factors, we started to prime them to look for individual character strengths. We help them with engagement. We help them with relationship, with positive emotions. As you can see, uh, we started to use the PERMA model in order to enhance the group experience. So what happens is there are 14 therapeutic factors that have to do with group factors, and there are 24 individual dynamics for character strengths. So the facilitators, as they're trained, are looking for group and individual factors. And what happens is people really enjoy coming to the group. They feel the transition. And much more importantly than just feeling it in the group, it, it transfers out of the group. Um, and resource priming means that before we go into the group sessions, we think about each person's character strength so that the facilitators, rather than sort of running in and trying to run a group or, you know, having some kind of an agenda, what they're thinking about are the strengths of each person in the group. And that's called resource priming. And if you're loaded to look for that, if you're prepped to look for that, you're very likely to find it. Um, the shift has been from wrong to strong. So I changed the name of it from interactive behavior therapy to positive interactive behavior therapy to reflect this change. Uh, we now in uh, uh, start will have a uh, certificate uh, program where we train the facilitators. Uh, if there are 14 therapeutic states, 24 character states, that means in a group, before we even begin, the facilitators are looking for 38 good things. We're trying to change the anxiety of transformation in someone's life to the transformation of anxiety. By putting the positive spin on this, what we're noticing is that the facilitators enjoy the group. The group receives this positivity and it transcends, it moves out of the group process. Now on to uh, learned hopefulness. Um, uh, this book uh, uh, came out just um, in June, and um, it, it it really encapsulates a lot of the work I've done uh, in my life, but in uh, in a condensed way. I, I became fascinated with positive psychology about ten years ago, uh, but. Um, uh, what really intrigued me was that hope was the only positive emotion that required negativity or uncertainty to be activated. And that just really got me thinking, my goodness, in the kind of work that we all do, 
we we are exposed to uncertainty and negativity every day and now during COVID-19 uh, <laughs> there's no short supply of negativity and uncertainty so what emotion is absolutely geared for this well it, it ends up being hope so I did a, a good deal of uh, research and studying on the difference between what's called high hope people and people with low hope and um, in, in looking at the different theories um, it was really clear that the researchers who were looking at hope weren't really um, reading uh, everybody else, like the medical people weren't reading the social psych, the social psych people weren't reading the business people, and the clinical people weren't reading the other ones. So I thought, well, let me take a look at all the different research. And um, it started to look like the, you know, there's a parable about the three blind men who hold the elephant. One holds the tail and says it looks like a rope. One holds the ear and says it looks like a bird or a fan. The other one grabs the leg and says it looks like a tree. Well, instead of trying to pick which theory was right, I said, what would hope look like if all the research was right, but they just had a piece of it? What emerged is something I call the hierarchy of hope. It gives us layers and ways that people can cultivate hope in their life. Um, and this is part of what's now gone back into the IBT. And, and it's not just, uh, you know, for people uh, that we work with, this is a much broader base way of thinking about how we can use hope in our um, life. Um, I've been very lucky that uh, a number of people who, uh, who've read the book had really positive things to say about it. And the, the, the reason why I'm putting that up there is that um, we have spiritual, uh, psychological, uh, um, educational, and business people uh, looking at this from different angles and recognizing that the research on hope is so powerful that if we can learn how to harness it, we can learn how to transition and transform uh, ourselves and those we work with. Finally, we're down to character strengths. Um, so I am going to think out loud here uh, uh, and I'm going to not put us into a breakout room. And this yes. is Beth. Um, two things. One, we had a couple questions about how communicative the individuals were in the groups that you were running. Yes, good. Um, a great question. Did everybody hear your question to me? Yes? Okay. And so um, uh, we had different layers. Uh, we had uh, very low functioning people, IQs all under 50, um, and then people with IQs uh, between 50 and 70. Um, the difference is in how you look for the different um, uh, uh, strengths. So as an example, um, let, me, let me pick one uh, like altruism right? Altruism is the therapeutic factor. It's part of the group factor. So um, in a higher functioning group, what you might see is that if somebody in the group is uh, crying, you might see somebody um, put their hand on that person's shoulder uh, and give words of encouragement um, somebody saying, geez, I'm going into the hospital. I'm nervous. I'm worried about that. And person next to him puts their hand on the shoulder and says, listen, I went into the hospital, um, but uh, I came out. The doctors did their job. I know you're nervous, but we're here for you. I'll come visit you. That would be a fairly high functioning group. Um, in in uh, groups with the IQs uh, uh, lower than 50, one of the things we found was that it's much more concrete. So as an example, uh, somebody would be crying in the group, maybe talking about having to go into the hospital. Another person in that group would simply pick up a box of tissues and either hand them a tissue or hand them a box. They might not use any words. So the concept is the same. And that's there's 38 of these. I won't go through all of them. But the concept 
of being able to spot how it's manifesting is where the art and the science mix. That facilitators are trained to understand what these principles are, but if people have lower levels of functioning, the way that it's going to come out is going to be more concrete than somebody uh, higher level. It, does that get to the um, answer? Does that help? Thank you, Dan. Yes. And I sure. also wanted to add that I think we're ready to try breakouts again. I think we're, <laughs> we are. We're ready. We're hopeful. Excellent. We're hopeful. It's, <laughs> uh, you see, this is what happens. God gives me this, this, this challenge. Every once in a while. It's nice to write about hope, but guess what? We're going to have to test it. Well, I'm extremely hopeful because I, I have trust. I have faith. We are smart, uh, Dan. We pivot. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Okay, so um, all right, here we go. We're going into this exercise, and uh, let's see how we do. All right, I'm going to do this. I'm, okay. I'm going to do the same kind of thing I did before. Not we're not in groups yet, so don't hit the group button yet. Uh, I have to set this up. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to do the same thing, if you would, uh, to make sure you jot this down, right, so that you have something uh, to go into the uh, breakout rooms with. So I'm going to ask you to think about a time in your life that was absolutely a peak experience. It, it's the reason you've, you felt you were put here on the earth. It was just absolutely spectacular, right? And that might have been only a moment. It might have been a time in your life, like the summer you traveled through Europe. It could have been um, uh, an extended period of time. It could have been the two years I was, you know, fill in the blank. But I'd like you to think about a peak experience in your life and take a moment to jot down what that is. And again, please do that. Please jot it down because you'll need that experience as we move forward. And as each person does that, the next thing I'm going to ask you to do is hold on to that peak experience. And take a look at these 24 different character strengths from the VIA character.org website. Take a look at them. And I'd like you to identify three to five that were happening during your peak experience. And write them down. So think about it. What was happening during your peak experience? You're going to have about another 30 seconds for that. Okay. And again, now what you should have is you should have the peak experience. You should have the peak experience, and then you should have three to five character strengths. I'm assuming that everybody is ready with that. Okay. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is imagine that I've become an evil wizard. <laughs> Uh, not too hard to imagine. All right. But imagine I've become an evil wizard. And I'd like you to take a look at those character strengths that you've identified. And imagine that I had the power as the evil wizard to prevent you from using any of the ones you've listed for three months. And again, take a look at the three to five that you've written down and imagine you couldn't use them for three months. And now how about we imagine that I'm going for my evil wizard certificate and I want to really see if I had the power to stop you from using them for a year. Now what I'd like you to do is just jot down how your life would be, words. What kind of 
life experience would you have if you couldn't use those top strengths? If you couldn't use the strengths you had during the peak experience? Now, we're going to give the breakout rooms another try. We're going to do that for uh, about six minutes. And same thing, as, as soon as you get into those rooms, uh, please have one person, uh, please uh, somebody um, uh, identify yourself that you'll, you'll be the representative for the group. And then each person to take about 25 to 30 seconds to just say what you felt when you couldn't use those experiences what were the words on your list was it depressed was it despondent what did you feel when they were taken away all right so we have our team we're going to give it a shot let's see what happens thanks Every dan time. we're going to try this again thanks for your patience dan if you could stop sharing your screen that would be great as well and here we go Everybody, you're still in the main room, so we ask yes. that you just remain muted. Yes, thank you. I'm going to just give it 15 seconds. I have clicked the button to send everyone into their room, so maybe it's just taking a minute because of the volume of this group. Okay, I apologize. It does not look like it is moving. Thank you, Emory. Dan, are you there? Yes, I am. Here we are. Here we are. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Dan. I love it. Yes, so I just wanted to offer an alternative, which is if we'd like to ask a couple of volunteers to share their thoughts, we could do it in this plenary group. Sure. So um, uh, apparently there's yet uh, a larger and greater evil wizard in the world right. <laughs> who has taken away our power. So, so let's do this. Um, what, what I'm in chat so that it doesn't disrupt everyone. Okay, Beth, and then you can call their names. All right. All right. Thank you. That would, that would be great. And, and um, yes, let's do that. As a large group, um, uh, we're going to invite people uh, to just say, what did that feel like? What were the words that came up as you um, uh, took away those strengths, as the evil wizard took away the strengths? And as you get ready, um, should I stop sharing my screen uh, or? No, it's, it's okay. Okay. So who'd be, who'd be willing to say some of those words? So if you sh if they st if you stop sharing, Beth, we can see the person who's speaking. Yeah, I think that's there. We go. Terrific. So one of the first people to share their thoughts in chat was Doris Weiss. Doris, if you're able to turn on your camera and microphone. Oh wow! I'm seeing chat light up. Great, great. Hi, Doris. Hi. Um, so I felt uh, that this would be bleak depressing and and hopeless without those um, strengths that I had identified. Wow. Terrific. Well, now, now that I've depressed everybody. <laughs> oh, thank you, Doris. I think what's, what's terrific about your sharing is if people can glance over, and I see Bruce is uh, up there, and um, if you saw it looking dark, sad, serious, frustrated, depressed, without love, empty, uh, helpless, hopeless, um, uh, stressed, bored, terminal, irritation. It, one of the things, as you see them all pop up there, I'd, I'd like you to just take a, a moment to appreciate what we did in this sort of micro way by having you think about what was happening in your life when you were feeling so good and then taking those strengths away. What we've really done in that moment 
is we've identified the other side of character strengths. And so if I could, I'm going to invite you to look at this screen because this is the new model of mental health. This is what the positive psychologists have been working on. It's not just the character strengths that we're after. It's what happens if they're missing? What happens if they're too much? And we start to see a pattern emerge that allows us to recognize what happens when somebody cannot be who they were meant to be. Each person, as you wrote down on your um, chat box, what your feelings were, was identifying the feelings perhaps of many of the people you've worked with. I'd like you to think about that for a second. The kind of words that were being generated, hopeless, helpless, depressed, bored, scared, right? All of these things. Think of the folks that have had the greatest difficulty that you've worked with. And another way to start looking at that, instead of seeing that as just a behavior problem, we can start to think about them as people who are having difficulty using their strengths. The thing I like most about this new way of thinking about mental health is that it's not only descriptive, it's prescriptive. When, if you would, I'm going to just show you down here. I don't know if you can see my, uh, but you see under love uh, on the far left-hand side, the, um, the virtues, the six virtues are on the left. And if we look in the love and look right in the middle, you'll see kindness, right? There's a program I consult with in another country where um, the uh, admittance into that program, you had to be a, um, uh, a pedophile. Uh, with an intellectual and a psychiatric disability. So it's a jail and it is a, a treatment program, but it's also a farm and a bike factory. And one of the things that happened is uh, we came in and we started uh, recognizing that many of the people in this program were indifferent. They didn't have kindness. They were cruel. They didn't have kindness. So they were assigned a pigeon or a rabbit and they had to keep the pigeon or rabbit alive for an entire year. The mandatory sentence in this particular country is seven years. So they could go a whole year. And if that animal died, <laughs> their sentence was set back to day one. So there was tremendous motivation and they learned to cultivate kindness. It was a correction. That's just one small example, but I wanted to have you uh, with this experience at the end so that you can see what positive psychology is doing is not only looking at the things that we want to aspire to, but also to take a look at the blocks or the inhibitions that may be keeping us held back. So once again, for this uh, presentation and a bunch of other resources, as well as the first couple of chapters of uh, Learned Hopefulness, uh, you can text HOPEFUL to 44222. And uh, I am going to um, bring this part of the presentation to a close. And thank you. And uh, then just open it to see if there are any thoughts or questions. And uh, then turn this back over to you folks. Thank you, Dan. We had a question from Alex who said, what does it mean when the absence of intimacy is isolation slash autism? Yeah, in this, uh, this is a tentative chart. So uh, Chris Peterson put this together. Um, the, the natural autism um, that is identified in uh, childhood, that people uh, go through a period of time where they're very self-absorbed. I don't think it was the best word, I, but I did want to share you the actual uh, research um, uh, paper that's uh, that's out there. Uh, this is being modified constantly. This was several years ago now. I think it's four years ago now uh, that this first came out. So people are tweaking it. But I want you to see the um, uh, the original. The the flip side of intimacy is a, a type of isolation that involves um, uh, feeling. 
um, too threatened, um, too self-absorbed in order to make the connection. And I think that's what the original researchers were trying to identify with that. Thank you so much for that clarification, Dan. I think that that was very helpful. You're welcome. I do know that I believe Joni would like to join you for a brief discussion before we transition. Sure. Here I am before the transition. Guess who I'm not, what I'm not doing, Dan? Breakout <laughs> <laughs> No more breakout groups. Yeah. Breakout groups. So yeah. I just wanted to um, just talk about what your experience has been with START and how we apply positive psychology to our practices. I know you're in our film and you have worked with us for, I don't know, 150 years. Yes, um, exactly. And what, how do you see the work of START connecting with your work um, in the field? You, you know what, uh, um, I'm really glad you asked that, John, because uh, uh, in positive psychology, we think about it at the uh, individual level, um, at the uh, at the interactive level, and then at the uh, sort of um, organizational level. And I think with Stuart, one of the really beautiful things that's happened as you've embraced this uh, um, this positive psychology has been that the organization has taken on this sense of um, well-being is going to be at the the core of what we do it always has been but uh, now we're going to apply the tools of well-being because before we were in some ways limited to just uh, take away the pain and suffering so that's the first part the organization has grasped that the second thing is that the the staff um, have embraced this you know one of the dilemmas uh, in the field uh, early on, and then I think it was a continual issue, was uh, burnout, turnover, you know, people uh, not feeling um, uh, like they mattered or that the, the work was really fulfilling. Well, that's really changed with START because um, at that level, what happens is people are looking forward to building one another up, both at the staff level and then, uh, you know, working with uh, with residents or, or members in a program. So um, just the idea that these are not technique -y kind of things just that you use with others. These are things that f make your life fulfilling and the work together fulfilling. And then finally, we have new tools in a new toolbox. Uh, the thing that's very uh, exciting for me, for whatever reason, I end up being in that role now of trying to help create and uh, disseminate these new tools because I think there's a loop. I think there's like a type of resonance. Uh, if I come to work and I feel good about what I'm doing and I use something that helps somebody else feel good and I see the effect of that, um, they get filled up, I get filled up, I get to share that back with the staff and then that gets shared directly with the organization. So the three main areas, you know, of, uh, of organizational, the um, uh, uh, the um, the group itself of, of workers and then the tools for the people we serve. I think uh, START has done an exemplary job of implementing all of that, not to mention the research. Well, you have done an exemplary job of being our friend and partner and mentor for, for many, many years, and we continue to um, be inspired and encouraged by you and the work that you do and how it intersects with us and the work that we do. And I think you remind us all that positive psychology is practiced throughout humanity in order to be effective. So it isn't a technique to use with people with disabilities. If you don't know your own strength of character, you cannot spot it in others. Um, you cannot engage in a strength-based relationship unless you know your own strength. So I think that is an important lesson that we, we try to practice every day in the work that we do. It helps us to overcome biases when, because of many of the people we see have terrible reputations on paper and just trying to strength spot somebody who's got like 7,000, and I'm sure you saw that from the people from Willowbrook that would deinstitutionalize the 7,000 documents to prove that they are unworthy of being considered humane, <laughs> human. So, right. you know, I mean, that, that's just sort of part of, just sort of part of our mission is giving people their humanity back 
And in order to do that, we have to own our own humanity. So, Very, very, very true. I, the, the one thing I would add, you know, we have a saying in positive psychology that it's not a spectator sport. If you're going to learn about this stuff, that you have to really understand it from the inside out. And I'll, I'll also just say today was just a taste of, uh, of it. You know, we did one element of one component of PERMA. There's uh, 30 different elements of just the P part in PERMA. Uh, but, but all the other ones, it's, it's understanding it's not just about having a positive emotion or just being happy. It's about genuine, honest, uh, uh, engaged well-being. And uh, that's the thing I like about STAR2 is that we're, we're really working with the whole institution, the whole organization, the whole group. Um, it's it's at uh, that kind of integrated level. Yes, and so just one final thought. Um, you know, there were some comments in the comment box. People were worried about people who are aggressive or nonverbal or severely impaired, and how could they possibly benefit if they're not verbal? Well, positive practices are a vibe. It's it's a and I know I'm dating myself five, what the hell is she talking about? But it's, a, it's, a, it's an approach. It's seeing, it's being grateful for the person in front of you and noticing who they are that has nothing to do with their skills and abilities. It's their inner, well, it's their inner self, you know, that you're trying to mm -hmm. get. And I think being aggressive has nothing to do with it and being nonverbal has nothing to do with it. It's more than that. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Sure. One of the things that um, uh, that we do, I'll, I'll just mention briefly a piece of research, and then I'll I'll talk um, a little bit about how they interact. But one of the things that um, we're, we're very much interested in is uh, the a differential. The the very last experience is something called the positive deviant, um, uh, meaning what I had you do is um, uh, do a, a technique within a technique, a positive subtraction. First, I had you think about something very, very positive, and then we took it away, right? Well, if you can imagine that when we're looking in, um, in positive psychology, we very often do that. We look for the differential or the contrast. So one of of the ways that we start to approach really aggressive and violent behavior and whatever is to, to start understanding that it's not 24 seven, 365, that there's a differential. And the question becomes, what's, what's the positive deviant? And the positive deviant is when does it not occur? Because we spend so much time because of our way of thinking about things that we're almost always focused on how many times they did this and what's wrong and what's wrong and what's wrong. And, and so uh, a shift in the perception has to do with being able to identify the times when this isn't happening. And I know this sounds simplistic. It sounds like a, you know, differential reinforcement of other behavior. But all day long, Dan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But, but what happens is um, when you learn how to do that, when it, when it comes to helping people transform, what you learn is that there are principles there that uh, almost always we can mine and understand and then help recreate. And then um, uh, you start to look at the environment in a, in a very different way about creating what, what that positive uh, um, deviant has done. And one of the things that we're working on, we have a, a pretty good sized research project that's uh, being launched now um, because the meditation techniques are uh, nonverbal techniques uh, that we've been researching. Uh, we've done a lot of work with uh, an ancient form of meditation known as Tonglen, another one known as Feeding Your Demons, to understand what that differential is when things feel negative and, and not. Had we had more time, I, I would have walked you through one of the meditative techniques just so that you could feel it because it has to do with uh, not with words but with uh, experience so that you feel something that is different than uh, maybe what the negative norm is. Well, thank you. And we, um, we will be talking in the next few days and then 
in the next coming months about in training all the new people who are on I can't even believe there's so many people we're training. And about all of this and about the intersectionality between cultural competency, mindfulness, wellness, positive psychology, all of the things that we talk about, and they apply to all of humanity. It is not conditional. It it mm. applies to your level of disability or ability. It's it's about understanding people's humanity and building their positive experiences. And I think you said like several years ago in a slide that you probably have long forgotten, um, usually people who are doing well and having a positive experience do not get angry. Yes, right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. I'll, I'll just I'll just uh, end with uh, one one thing that because um, I'm in touch now with all the other folks in positive psychology is a pretty good sized network and the some of the you know main researchers and one of the things that's happening um, uh, is that a lot of the work from the humanistic movement has come back now with uh, really solid research beneath it. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs has been uh, reformulated and identified now with really solid pieces of research um, and how we can move move people from one layer to the next and to the next with uh, not only good uh, good research to show it can be done, but an applied sense of what we need to do that. Well, thank you. And um, for those of you who are in the network, Dan is um, never too far away from us. Um, I, I will remind all of you that Dan mentioned there'll be an, a course on how to practice group therapy uh, using Dan's strategies and positive psychology that will be offered by the Center for Start Services in the coming months. Um, and, um, and also Dan it has plays a pivotal role in our training and development, both our professional training and development and the development of the strategies that we use. And we are forever appreciative and thankful. He never says yeah. no, we never say no. He only gets paid like 50% of the time. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and we will see thanks, you. Thanks, Jody. Thank you. All righty. Thanks. Have a great conference here. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Joni, for that wonderful discussion.